So, in this video, we're going to deliver upon an earlier claim. We're going to prove that ought of C over R only has two things in it, namely the identity map and complex conjugation. So this was a claim that we made in an earlier, earlier video, and now we're going to prove it. So maybe just for framing, let's briefly remember what ought of C over R is. Odd of C over R consists of those automorphisms of C that fix R, such that sigma fixes R. And remember what that means. What that means is that, well, it means that sigma of R is equal to R for every real number R. So it leaves all of big R inert, fixes all of the real numbers. What we want to prove is there are only two things that do this. There are only two guys in odd of C over R. These are one, the identity, and complex conjugation. So I think the proof of this pretty much has just two ideas. There are two main ideas in the proof of this. So let's look at both of them individually because they're both in important in their own right, and their ideas which will keep coming up in the future, and then we'll see why they imply the result we want. So the first point, the first idea, is that if you've got any sigma in odd of c over r, it's totally determined by what it does to i. In other words, we know what sigma of i is, so sigma of i determines It's going to determine sigma of zeta for every for every complex number zeta. Sigma of i determines everything. Once you know sigma of i, the game is up and kind of nothing more can happen. So why is this? Why would this be true? Why is sigma of i going to determine everything? Well, let's let's take a look. So we want to know what sigma of zeta is. And we remember that zeta can be written in the form a plus b i, with a and b real numbers. And that's the crucially important fact. It's the fact that we can write it as a and b, and these are inside of r. Because remember that zeta has to fix r. So that's the crucial fact. But let's see it. Let's see why that's the crucial fact. So sigma of zeta, all right, well, that's sigma of a plus b i. And then using the automorphism properties, using the fact that this guy commutes, that sigma commutes with addition and multiplication, this is going to be equal to sigma of a plus sigma of b times sigma of i. Now we see why it was so important that a and b were inside of r, because sigma fixes r. It leaves all of R inert. So that tells us that sigma of A is equal to A, and then sigma of B is equal to B. So this whole thing is just equal to A plus B times sigma I. So sigma of A plus B I, this guy, is equal to A plus B times sigma of I. So sigma of I is the only thing that can change. This is the guy determining the whole show. Sigma of i is. Alright, so that's this first claim. Sigma is totally determined what it does to i. And this is an idea we'll keep on using. We're kind of using this linear algebraic fact that c is a vector space over r. with basis just one, the identity, <coughs> sorry, one, regular one, the basis one, and i. And that's really what makes this magic work, this total determination here. And we'll end up using analogous facts to this later on. Whenever we're talking about something called finite extensions, we'll end up using a fact like this. And this fact is basically what makes finite extensions nice. So we'll talk more about this later. 
but I think it's kind of nice to know it's coming now. We will end up using tricks like this in the future. The fact that we've got some finite basis, and the automorphisms are somehow totally determined by what they do to that basis, just like it ha just like happened over here. All right, so that's the first point. Now let's go to the second one. The second point is that any sigma inside of odd, C over R, well, whatever sigma of i is, it has to be a root of x squared plus 1. So we know that sigma is totally determined by what it does to i, and now we're saying that sigma of i has to be a root of x squared plus 1. Why x squared plus 1? Where do we get this random polynomial from? from? Why not some other polynomial? Well, the reason why x squared plus 1 uh, is the thing that we care about is because i is a root of x squared plus 1. And we'll see that in a second. But that's why this polynomial is important. That's where it comes from. So the fact that sigma i must be a root of this guy is somehow tied up with the fact that i is a root of this guy. So let's see that. And again, it's going to be the kind of familiar fact that we stressed a lot in the first video, that sigma commutes with real polynomials. With real polynomials. That's why this is true. So let's turn through the calculation with that insight. Well, 0 is equal to sigma of 0, which is equal to sigma of i squared plus 1. I'm kind of writing this backwards, really. Maybe we'd start with this end and go over here, but the equation will come out a little bit nicer this way. What is sigma of i squared plus 1? Well, using the automorphism properties, that sigma of i squared plus sigma of 1. And then using the fact that sigma has to fix r, you see that this is equal to sigma of i squared plus 1. So there we have it. This is just saying that sigma of i is a root of x squared plus 1. Now this is a very important fact or idea. We'll end up using this very often in what comes. In fact, maybe this is one of the key ways in which automorphisms help us understand polynomials. Remember, that's kind of one of our main mantras going in here. Because what's happening is we're saying that sigma somehow, sigma is permuting the roots of x squared plus 1. That's what's going on here. Because sort of sigma of i has to be a root of the same polynomial. So you started with i, root of this polynomial, and sigma of i has to also be a root. So since this is bijection, it's going to end up permuting the roots. And this is one of the ways in which we get to play with automorphisms and polynomials. One of our kind of running ideas. This fact, this fact about permuting roots will be a common theme and we'll end up using it all the time. This will end up being a crucial fact in what happens later. But anyway, for now we don't have to worry about that too much. Again, I just kind of wanted to let you know that it's coming, so you can see it as it's happening rather than having to be told after the fact that it occurred. Alright, so that's the second point. We've now proven both of our points. We know that in the first point, we know that any sigma inside of odyssey over r is totally determined by i. And now we know that whatever sigma of i is, it better be a root of x squared plus 1. And these two facts together are going to give us that odd of c over r just has two elements. One, the identity, and complex conjugation. So I think it's relatively easy to see that at this point, and maybe you would like to pause the video and kind of see how you can use these two facts to reach this conclusion. But we'll just say it very quickly now, too. So, just to wrap up, just wrapping up. So we know that sigma, or let's write everything out, 
any sigma inside of odd of c over r is determined by determined by sigma of i and we know that sigma of i is a root of x squared plus 1. There are only two roots, there are only two complex roots of x squared plus 1. Namely, i and negative i. So we're going to get that sigma of i is either equal to i or sigma of i is equal to negative i. And these are the only two choices because there are only two roots here and this totally determines sigma. So sigma can only come in one of two forms. The form where it leaves i alone and this of course is going to be the identity and the form where it turns i into negative i and that's complex conjugation. So that's how we get our desired fact from using our two key ideas. And that's what we wanted to prove.